John Prescott says he will give up his grace and favour home at Dorneywood. Amid the mounting controversy over his official residence, he says he wasn't forced out. But in a statement, the Deputy Prime Minister admits his country home had become an increasing source of concern in his own party. Also tonight, America moves to end the nuclear standoff with Iran. It offers direct talks for the first time in 27 years. The victims of Europe's growing mountain of old computers and TVs, we have a special report. And after the wettest May for 20 years, why is there still a drought? In the south, fighting for his life, a young man is stabbed as he tries to stop an attack at a woman. His parents appeal for help. And coming home early, a sickness virus hits holidaymakers on board the Sea Princess. Good evening. In the last hours emerged that John Prescott will move out of his grace and favour home at Dorneywood. The Deputy Prime Minister had come under increasing pressure because while he no longer runs a department, he's retained his salary and country house. After pictures were printed of him playing croquet in the grounds while the Prime Minister was out of the country, there were calls for his resignation, even from within his own party. Tonight, Mr Prescott said the decision to move out was his and that the controversy was creating a distraction. Carol Walker reports. John Prescott phoned the Prime Minister this morning and told him that as the controversy over Dorneywood was getting in the way of the job he was trying to do, he decided it was right to give it up. It was these newspaper pictures of him playing croquet last Thursday afternoon while the Prime Minister was abroad that sparked a real outcry. The Deputy Prime Minister was already under pressure for keeping the 21-room country mansion as well as a government flat in London after losing his departmental responsibilities in the government reshuffle. Some Labour MPs said he seemed to have been stripped of his job whilst holding on to the perks and called for him to resign. It came after the revelations of his affair with his secretary Tracy Temple. Some MPs claimed this damaged Labour standing with women voters. But tonight, Mr Prescott insisted he would not be pushed out of his job as deputy leader of the government and the party. In a statement, he said, I've accepted that my continued use of Dorneywood is getting in the way of doing my job in government. I've told the Prime Minister that it is my personal decision that I no longer want to be the official resident. Tony Blair will be hoping this will be enough for him to keep his deputy fearing that if Mr Prescott goes, it will reopen the questions over how long he can remain as Prime Minister. Let's talk to Cal now at Westminster. Cal, this story's just emerged in the last hour or so. Is it going to be enough to take the heat off John Prescott now? Well, that's certainly what he'll be hoping, but I think the problem is that it really looks as though he's been forced into this position. We know that he fought to hold on to Dorneywood when he lost most of his department in the government reshuffle, and it's only now, after days, weeks of scandal over this, that he's been forced to decide to give it up. So he'll certainly be hoping that it will ease the pressure. I think if he'd done this at the time that he lost his department, then he wouldn't be in the mess he's in now. He's still under a great deal of pressure, but perhaps this will be enough to enable him to keep his job. And Carol, how does this reflect on Tony Blair now, who after all took the decision to allow Mr Prescott to keep the grace and favour home in the first place? Well, once again, Tony Blair has shown that reshuffles are not exactly his forte. Uh, many people felt that that decision to keep John Prescott uh, in his role as Deputy Prime Minister, getting rid of his whole department, a huge amount of things that he used to have to run, he no longer has to do, leaving him with a much smaller job, but all the perks of the job, Many people fear that that sent out all the wrong signals about the Labour government. Now, clearly, Tony Blair is determined to keep hold of John Prescott. He fears that if John Prescott is forced out, that will destabilise his government and reopen all the questions about when he is going to go. But I don't think this episode has done anything to bolster the authority of either the Prime Minister or his deputy. Carol, thanks very much. America has tonight, for the first time in over a quarter of a century, signalled it's ready for direct talks with Iran. This major shift in US policy comes as international tension grows over Iran's nuclear enrichment programme and fears it may be preparing to build a nuclear weapon. President Bush said the US would have face-to-face -face talks with Iran, but only on condition that the country's nuclear programme is suspended. Iran's hardline President Ahmadinejad, who refers to America as the Great Satan, has yet to respond. Here's our special correspondent, Gavin Hewitt. You have to go back 27 years to images America has never forgotten. 
its diplomats blindfolded and held hostage in Tehran. Ever since, there has been little official diplomatic contact between the two countries. But today in Washington, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice announced a major shift in policy. America was prepared to talk directly to Iran alongside its European partners, but only if Tehran suspended its nuclear enrichment program. To underscore our commitment to a diplomatic solution and to enhance the prospects for success, as soon as Iran fully and verifiably suspends its enrichment and reprocessing activities, the United States will come to the table with our EU colleagues and meet with Iran's representatives. A short while later, President Bush was stressing that he was on a diplomatic offensive to end the standoff with a country he once branded part of an axis of evil. I, I thought it was important uh, for the United States to take the lead along with our partners, and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing robust diplomacy. I believe this problem can be solved diplomatically, and I'm going to give it every effort to do so. So what will Iran's hardline president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, make of all this? Well, tomorrow, the five permanent members of the Security Council are meeting in Vienna, and they'll finalize a whole package of incentives to persuade Iran to suspend some of its nuclear activities. But they'll also draw up a list of penalties if Iran refuses. <laughs> President Ahmadinejad was attending his father's funeral today. He has told crowds in recent months that there will be no turning back from the country's nuclear program. And tonight, the official Iranian news agency described the American offer as a propaganda move. It puts Iran on the back foot. It's up to them now to, uh, to see are they going to respond positively. And if not, they go to the Security Council. Russia and China agree to it all now. In recent months in Iran, there has been much speculation about a military attack. The Americans said today, all options remain on the table. But if today's offer of talks fails, force won't be the first step. The Bush administration believes it now has agreement from its allies, including Russia and China, to pursue sanctions against Iran. Gavin Hewitt, BBC News. Let's talk to our Middle East editor, Jeremy Bone, who's at the Foreign Office. Uh, Jeremy, no response yet from Tehran. What factors are likely to affect the response from there? Well, what will go into their decision, perhaps, is a function of what they really want. Now, if Ira the Americans believe that what Iran really wants is nuclear weapons. Quite simple. Uh, now, if that's the case, they may find it easier just to say no, especially because of the American precondition about stopping enriching uranium. But there's another school of thought that says there's a debate going on in Tehran about whether they really need nuclear weapons, whether the costs outweigh the benefits. Now, here at the Foreign Office, they're hoping that the prospect of American talks and also a few other inducements as well will be a pretty good carrot for those who want to rein back from confrontation with the West. And, Jeremy, does this make the prospect of military action against Iran any less likely now? Well, that's always a big question when we're dealing with this particular crisis. Uh, I was talking today to a man who had been one of President Clinton's chief advisers on the Middle East, and this is what, what he was saying. He said essentially that, that a force pulling America away from attacking Iran at some point over this is the fear that a war with Iran would not be a simple war. It would not be a limited war and that Iran can retaliate in all kinds of ways and make it very difficult and painful for the Americans and their allies, not least in Iraq. Now, the force driving, he said, the force driving the Americans towards taking military action is the feeling that, that President Bush does not want to be the president who allowed a member of what he called the axis of evil to get a nuclear weapon. And if the chances of that happening seem to be increasing, if diplomacy isn't working, then the Americans will be taking out their military plans. Okay, Jeremy, thanks. President Bush has responded to allegations that U.S. Marines killed 24 Iraqi citizens in the western Iraqi town of Haditha last November. He said he was troubled by the allegations, which are now being investigated by the Pentagon. The claims of a massacre are potentially the most damaging the Bush administration has ever faced. The president said people would be punished if laws have been broken. The illegal trade in electronic waste, old computers and TVs, is being described as one of the most serious risks to human health and the environment. And it's growing. Over a million tonnes of it are smuggled out of Britain in a lucrative trade every year. 
Much of it ends up in China, where it's broken up in dangerous conditions. In a moment, Rupert Wingfield Hayes reports from Guayu in southern China. But first, David Shipman on the electronic mountain growing here. This is the dark side of our electronic way of life. Televisions and computers discarded by the million, victims of our culture of the upgrade. But while these units are soon forgotten, the hazardous metals inside them remain as toxic as ever, and the volume just keeps rising. Meet the new waste mountain, electronics, no longer as shiny as they were in the showroom, now chucked onto the scrap heap. The numbers involved in this are staggering. This is a tiny fraction of a growing and global problem. According to the UN Environment Programme, the world throws out up to 50 million tonnes of electronic waste every year. In the same period, British households alone discard 93 million old electronic items. And in America, 500 million PCs will have become obsolete by next year, according to official figures. This is what's supposed to happen, everything dismantled safely. Here at this new recycling plant in Teesside, the old electronics are broken up and the poisonous components extracted. But most electronic waste isn't handled this carefully. It ends up in landfill or it's smuggled abroad to be picked apart by unprotected hands. It's absolutely paramount that this product is handled appropriately, it's broken down appropriately, and similarly it doesn't go into landfill or with probably some less scrupulous cases actually going overseas to the sort of situation where you may have in China, for example, with products being handled without any protective equipment. In the last few days, this container was impounded at Southampton docks on its way to China. Inside, illegal waste. Not electronic this time, but all too often it is. And to face this growing threat, there's a rush to train new inspectors. Shipments of smuggled electronic waste are suddenly increasing. There's likely to be more of these that are coming through our ports in the UK. We want to have a bigger group of people carrying out inspections to detect these shipments. And that's why we're training up to 50 people over the next two months to carry out that work. But the challenge is huge. We usually think of containers bringing us cheap electronics from Asia. But there's a more sinister trade the other way as well. There's a good chance that this is where your old computer or printer or mobile phone is going to end up. Dumped beside a river here in southern China. I'm just outside the town of Guayu, which is just over there beyond the fields. And Guayu is the world centre for a huge and lucrative trade in reprocessing electronic waste. China actually completely bans the importation of any electronic waste from anywhere else in the world. But as you'll see in a minute when we go into Guayu, that's done absolutely nothing to stop the flow of a vast quantity of waste from all over the world ending up here. The streets of Guayu are piled high with it. In every side street and alleyway, fresh lorry loads were being unloaded. For less than two pounds a day, the workers here tear the computers apart by hand. Dismantling computers like this is not illegal. But because the waste is smuggled into China, people are scared of talking about what goes on here. Eventually, we found one scrap dealer. His face has been hidden for his own safety. Stuff from Europe arrives here every day, he tells me. In Europe, it would cost too much to recycle this stuff. It just gets thrown away. But here we can reclaim everything, all the copper, the aluminium, even the gold. He's right, but at what cost? With a secret camera, we managed to film these workers recycling circuit boards. They're melted over a stove. The fumes are thick with lead, which causes brain damage. What's left is then dumped beside the river. Soil tests here have shown lead levels 200 times the safe limit. At night, it's all set fire to, filling the air with deadly dioxins. Every year, the world throws away an ever-increasing amount of electronic junk. On average, we now change our mobile phones every 18 months, our computers every three to four years. Most of us give little or no thought at all about what happens to it once it's gone. 
but without much greater efforts by governments, manufacturers and by consumers, it's going to continue ending up like this, a burning toxic heap in somebody else's backyard. Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News, in Guayu, southern China. Well, David Shukman is with me now. And David, it's clear from seeing those two pieces that part of the problem is that the scale of this electronic waste is so immense, isn't it? It is, and many say we're very slow in tackling it. Part of the problem is the sheer speed with which electronic items are being sold. Let's look at the figures. 2004, globally, 183 million computers were sold worldwide. At the same time, 674 million mobiles. That's great for business, great for consumers, but there is a legacy. Now, add to that the rate of turnover. That's accelerating. The average lifespan these days of a typical computer is just two years. A few years ago, it was three times that. So no wonder there's this growing electronic waste mountain. So what can be done about it? Well, internationally, there's been a ban on shipping toxic waste, any kind of waste, to the developing world now since the early 90s. The trouble is it's obviously not working. Stuff's getting through. There are moves to tighten it up. The appointment of new inspectors in Britain may help, but that's just a start. In Europe, there's a new directive trying to get manufacturers and retailers to share the burden of dealing with the waste. The trouble is that here in Britain, that isn't yet in force. It was promised last year. It still is being delayed month by month. So what should ordinary members of the public do? Well, if you've got an old television or an old computer, try to find a proper recycling centre. They do exist. There aren't many, but they are growing in number. Okay. David, thanks very much. It was meant to be the government's big idea to help the country's poorest families. But for the second year in a row, almost two million of them have been given too much money in tax credits and the government wants it back. It's estimated an extra £1.8 billion has been paid out. The Treasury says the system's now being fixed, but opposition parties are calling for ministerial resignations. Our economics editor, Evan Davis, reports. It's been a perennial problem. If your details are not correctly updated, you could be receiving more money than you're entitled to. They hand money out, and in up to a third of cases, have to ask for some back. It's fascinating, but every time this issue hits the headlines, the BBC gets inundated with emails on it. At the news website, they've had over 840 so far today, mostly from frustrated claimants. Comments like, after numerous calls, me saying I was getting too much, they insisted I was entitled to it. Then they billed me for £2,500. We had to use the credit card to pay them off. They say it'll take me three years to pay back, so our son won't get a penny to help towards school shoes. I'm being asked to pay back £550. I was never paid in the first place. The money was given to my ex-wife and now they want me responsible for paying it back. I had a baby in October, haven't even bothered to apply for tax credits for fear of having to pay it back. And taxpayers grumble at billions of overspending. So what exactly is the problem? It's that claimants' lives change. And problem number one are the changes each year. The authorities guess how much credit you should get in 2005 using 2004's income as the starting point. So if your income goes up in 05 and you don't tell them quickly enough, you'll be overpaid. Problem number two are changes during the year. They usually pay out credit each month, but it's your income over the whole year that says how much you should get. So if your income changes within the year, you can find you've received too much credit in earlier months. I think the system is far too complicated. Um, Gordon Brown loves complex systems. Tax credits was his particular brainchild, and that's why it's as complicated as it is. If claimants are overpaid, and if it isn't the fault of revenue and customs, the money is clawed back, as Vanessa Jackson found out. One minute we were receiving the tax credits, the next day we weren't receiving a penny at all. Um, it's a big amount of money to take out of a family home all at once. As to the solution, the government's recently changed the rules to ease the problem. This financial year, we've made some quite substantial changes with effect from the beginning of April to reduce the extent to which changes in people's circumstances require adjustments to be made in their tax credits. That, I think, is going to make uh, quite a big difference to, to help. But even he admits they've only solved a third of the problem Getting the right money to families is a headache until you can keep track of all their changing circumstances. Evan Davis, BBC News. 
New satellite images have been released which reveal the true extent of the devastation in Zimbabwe caused by President Mugabe's forced eviction policy. Police, they say, they're clearing illegal housing, but Amnesty International estimates that at least 700,000 people have been driven from their homes. Now, this shows an area called Porter Farm. Four years ago, there are countless roads, houses and other buildings. But fast forward to this year, and you can see it's all gone. Every last building demolished. The BBC is banned from Zimbabwe, but this report from Orla Guerin was filmed there and sent from neighbouring South Africa. Sunrise, downtown Harare. Here are some of Zimbabwe's forgotten people. Victims of an operation called Clear Out the Rubbish. Now, one year on, it's only the rubbish that's keeping these people alive. Remember this? Bulldozers swallowing whole communities, driving people from the cities. Some saw it as punishment for supporters of the opposition. And here is a rare glimpse of the results of the homeless the government prefers to forget. Patrick and his brother sift through the rubbish they've gathered recycling and reselling what they can. On a good day, they make 200,000 Zimbabwean dollars between them, enough for two loaves of bread. Often, we go without food, Patrick says, because many people rely on the dumps for survival. If you get there late, you won't find anything. A new wilderness grows where major settlements once stood. President Robert Mugabe is turning back time. The next generation are the children of despair. They have no way to stay, no food, no shelter, no access to facilities, to amenities, to social services. It's a tragedy. Back at the camp, there is new grief. Patrick's neighbour, Memory, has just lost her husband to AIDS. He might have lived a lot longer if they still had a home. Now, somehow, she must support her family, including her two-week-old baby called Blessing. <laughs> but what future is there for anyone at this camp? Life expectancy in Zimbabwe is now the lowest in the world. Night falls in a country of secrets and lies. One of the greatest lies that all of this suffering does not exist. Orla Guerin, BBC News, South Africa. Thousands of university students are facing more cancelled exams and unmarked coursework after lecturers failed to resolve their dispute over pay. Members of NAPFI and the AUT have been refusing to set or mark student exams until their demand for a 23% rise is met. Union leaders say further industrial action is likely. Now it's the last day of the month and it's official. This has been the wettest May for more than 20 years. So why do water companies still have hose pipe bans in place and why is there a drought order in Surrey? Luisa Baldini looks at the strange relationship between rain and the water in our pipes. When you look at a lake like this, which is almost filled to the brim with water, it's difficult to believe that we are technically in the middle of a drought. But this is mainly surface water due to all the rain that we've been seeing in May. What we can't see is that beneath us, underneath the soil, there is very little water. And that's what's known as a groundwater drought. The southeast is also experiencing a meteorological drought, according to the experts. That's due to low rainfall over the past 18 months. Here at Reading University, rain readings are taken on a daily basis. While we have had an exceptionally wet May, the wettest for two decades, there hasn't been enough recent rainfall overall to replenish reserves. Nationally, the winter saw only 62% of the average rain for December, January and February. But it's the southeast of England that's most affected. There, 16 of the last 18 months have had below average rainfall. You can see how dry the soil is here already. 
despite all the rainfall in May. Yeah, it's uh, really cracked. Extremely cracks everywhere. And um, a lot of the water we had in May ran off the ground. Um, the plants have used it, it's evaporated. Um, and it's not been replenished. We need several months of rain in the winter to replenish the, the deeper water supplies. So even if the May rain were to continue, forecasters say the drought would remain. There's no clear signal coming through at the moment as to what sort of summer we're going to have. But even with a, a slightly wetter than average summer, we're still not really going to help with the drought situation because, again, that water won't get down through into the bedrock, which is where we really need it. That means hosepipe bans are likely to stay and there could be more drought orders on the horizon. Luisa Baldini, BBC News, Reading. 10 o'clock news hour continues on BBC News 24 with much more on the news that John Prescott is to give up his grace and favour residence. And in sport, Chelsea's £30 million man. Within the last half hour, the club confirmed they've signed striker Andrei Shevchenko. And on BBC One, I'll be back with the headlines after we've joined our news teams where you are. Bye for now. All right, good evening to you. I'm Danny Sinha. A Bratnell man who tried to intervene when he saw a woman being assaulted is tonight in a critical condition in hospital. Ian Montgomery, who's only 26, was enjoying a weekend with friends in Nottingham when he was stabbed. Rachel Lynch reports. Ian's family have come up from Berkshire to be by his bedside and help police with their appeal for witnesses. They're proud of their son's bravery. Morally, these things cannot be allowed to happen. A young girl in distress, being abused and attacked. Both my husband and my sons would not stand by and let that happen. And I'm proud of him. Ian had been at a reunion with old friends from Derby University. They'd been out in Nottingham's trendy Hockley district. As they were leaving a bar, Ian saw a woman being attacked and went with his friend to help her. He was trying to do the honourable thing, but it landed him in a critical condition in hospital with stab wounds to his chest and back. I'm just angry now after getting over the initial shock. Um, I'm angry for my brother first and foremost, for he shouldn't be in there in the first place in the condition that he's in. Um, I'm angry for, for the effect that it's had my immediate family here, my mum, my dad, my, my relatives, his close friends and whatnot. And I'm just angry at the, the cowardice that's been displayed by these, these whoever's done it. It's, there's, there's no need to carry knives in the first place. Police are looking through CCTV from Saturday night and Sunday morning to try to piece together exactly what happened and try and trace Ian's attacker. My personal feeling is that Ian's acted as his instincts have taken him. Um, and, and he's no doubt saved this girl to his own cost. I would advise people generally to stand back and call the police. Tonight, Ian remains in a critical but stable condition in the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. All his family can do now is hope that the person responsible is found. Somebody out there has seen something. Somebody's not coming forward and they've got to do it. It could be their son. Rachel Lynch with that report there. More than 200 passengers on board a Southampton-based cruise ship have been struck down with the norovirus, which causes vomiting and diarrhoea. The P&O-owned Sea Princess is returning early from her voyage so that she can be disinfected from stem to stern. The decision has been taken to miss out a stop in Lisbon and bring the ship home to Southampton a day early. Passengers will get a 30% refund. Princess Cruises say the ship will then sail as planned on Saturday. Well, I think it's not cruise ships. It's actually the whole of the UK. We've heard a lot about schools, children's centres, hospitals. It's something which at this time of the year, and we've had an extended rainy, cold season, it's something that's happening across the UK as a whole and from time to time comes on board the ships. Sussex police are waiting to hear of a body discovered near Barcelona. Is that of a man from Bogner who's vanished whilst on holiday in Spain. Nothing's been heard from Kevin Hall for the past three weeks. Today, his family made an emotional public appeal. Here's our Sussex reporter, Sean Killick. Please contact us so we can enjoy some more good times together. We all miss you so much. Heartbroken and fearing the worst. Shortly before Kevin Hoare's family were due to make this appeal about his disappearance, they were told Spanish police had discovered a body, though it's not yet been identified. 
But maintaining their hope, they decided to go ahead with their appeal for Kevin, or anyone who knows what's happened to him, to contact the police. We want to know that you're safe, no matter what the circumstances. And we just want you home safely. Someone must know something if they've been out there on holiday, who have come back. Just please, just pick up the phone and <coughs> phone the police. 39-year-old Kevin was last seen in a nightclub at the resort of Sitges near Barcelona on May the 11th. He texted his family to say he'd been to a beach party and out clubbing. But when they went to Gatwick Airport to meet him on May the 13th, he wasn't on the plane and hasn't been heard from since. We would like to speak to anybody that may have spoken to Kevin whilst he was on holiday, whether that was before or after we went missing. And if anyone spoke to Kevin, we'd like them to call Sussex Police on 0845 6070 999. Well, detectives here are now working through the British consulate and are waiting to hear further from the Spanish police and coroner's office, but they say they're still appealing for anyone with information to contact them. Sean Killick, BBC South Today, Littlehampton. A man has been seriously injured after his car crashed while being pursued by a police motorbike in Farnborough. The accident in Victoria Road happened after a police device which recognises number plates was triggered. The driver of a Vauxhall Vectra, a 23-year-old man, was taken to hospital with serious injuries. The incident has been reported to the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Parishioners at 14 churches across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight have been targeted by a conman asking for financial help with his family crisis. One of the incidents was at St Francis Church in Hilsey. The man often claims his mother is seriously ill and he needs money to visit her. The man is aged 35 to 40 and often calls himself James. Well, on to the weather now and Matt Taylor is here with a forecast for Southern England. Thank you very much. Very good evening to you. Another fine day for the most part. Still a little cool in that breeze, but changes taking place tonight. First of all, not quite as chilly as last night. And you'll also notice more in the way of clouds to the north and the east, producing one or two splashes of rain, a drizzle first thing. But that will clear off. Most of us will be dry and with increasing amounts of sunshine during the afternoon. And in that sunshine, it will at long last start to feel that little bit warmer. Temperatures up to around 18 Celsius, 64 Fahrenheit. Warmer still during the next few days. Plenty of dry and sunny weather on offer right into the weekend. Just a small risk on Sunday of just one or two light showers between the sunshine. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Well, that's news from us this evening. We'll be back tomorrow morning, bright and early from 6.30. But now it's time to hand you back to Fiona Bruce in London for another look at today's headlines. Bye for now. The main news tonight, John Prescott has announced he's to give up his grace and favour home at Dorneywood. The Deputy Prime Minister said it was a personal decision because the continued controversy was getting in the way of his role in government. And America has moved to end the nuclear standoff with Iran. It's offered the chance of direct talks for the first time in 27 years. News now getting underway over on BBC Two, but from all of us on the 10 o'clock team, good night.